Hey, good day. How's everybody doing? Um, so my name is Jonathan Cabrera. Um, I'm a professor in criminal justice. I pretty much, um, I'm this is my second presentation for the day. So if you've seen the first one, uh, there will be some overlying and underlying themes with that one. Um, today we'll be talking about the new Civic Square, um, and pretty much what that means in 2023. Obviously, we're about to go into the new year in a couple of months. So, um, just to give you a background of myself, um, I teach criminal justice. Um, I've worked in the Department of Corrections in New York City, so inside of Rikers Island, in halfway houses, things like that, working with people on parole, probation, things of that nature. Um, I bring that experience into the classroom. Um, I'm 30 years of age, but I started teaching college at 26. So I've been able to bring my youth um, as a way to be able to relate to students in the classroom as well. I also do music, I do hip hop, I rap, spoken word poetry, things like that. Um, so that helps me create um, a connectivity with the population as well, uh, wherever I go. So, and in addition, I also have my own platform, it's called Abstract Lifestyle. I'll put it in the chat right here. I'll also have it in the slide at the very end of the presentation, but you can follow at um, Abstract Lifestyle at um, on Instagram, Abstract underscore Lifestyle. And then my personal email as well for anybody that wants to stay connected will be right here in the chat as well so basically when we talk about um this idea of a new civic square back in the day civic square was basically like a, a public venue where people can come together they can exchange in thought uh they can exchange in ideas and things like that and that's how we've been able to progress and advance as a society to get us to the point that we're at right now is through people being able to, you know, um, congregate, converge, and to be able to have conversations from all walks of life, to be able to sharpen each other, just like a biblical scripture says, iron sharpens iron. Uh, the mind is basically like a piece of iron uh, sharpening against another piece of iron in somebody else's mind. So the reality is, um, as time moves on and as time progresses, this civic square changes in geographics uh geographic locations in venue and things of that nature um and for the most part in the history that we are aware of um you know we pretty much have known you know the the civic square to basically be like a infrastructure you know like if you're thinking new york uh probably washington washington square park can be an example of a um civic square maybe in front of city hall, wherever you're from, that's a civic square because people can gather there, they can protest, they can pray, they can do things like that um, if they feel moved to do so. Um, you know, we also have Union Square in New York. Um, if you're talking about maybe out in the West Coast, you know, the, the a civic square can be Venice Beach. You know, if you're talking about, uh, you know, Miami, you might be talking about South Beach or, you know, somewhere when with everybody's civic square is going to look different based on what the conversations are going to be based on what is easiest for that uh, demographic and, and geographically speaking, uh, what makes the most sense. So what we're going to get into is pretty much what are these new civic squares? Um, why it's important to recognize these civic squares, because at the end of the day, that's where we can collect a lot of new information and a lot of thought and not only collect it, but also be able to put it out there you know, especially as educators and people that are um, looking to always brush up on their knowledge and uh, information and things like that. So let me share the screen with y'all. So today we will specifically be learning about hip hop and social media, all right? So basically this is the new Civic Square uh, and the answer to inclusivity. So I already gave you a background of myself um, and again, as we just kind of went over, what is the civic square? So if you want to go by the actual definition, um, citizens and civil society uh, organizations are able to organize, participate, and communicate without hindrance. In doing so, they are able to claim their rights and influence the political and social structures around them. So um, ultimately, a civic square usually has to do with politics. It has to do with uh, you know sociology to whatever degree. Uh, but again, it's usually done in a public venue. You have the freedom of assembly, uh, you have the freedom of association, and you have the freedom of expression. So when we're talking about association, 
Typically, that means the right of any citizen to join a formal or informal group to take to uh, to take collective action, right? So, for example, today, if y'all are following the news, um, a lot of people went to Capitol Hill today because of what's happening out in Palestine and Israel. Um, that's an example of people gathering at a civic square. Um, you know, in this situation, they were protesting. They were, you know, expressing what was going on internally and what what they agreed upon. And so that's one example of that, right? Whether they did it formally or informally. Um, through this process, you could form a new group or join an existing group. Uh, you can create a club, cooperatives, non-governmental organizations, religious associations, political parties, unions, things of that nature. Uh, and no requirement, basically, in order for, you know, there's no actual requirement for this to, to go down. You know, it can happen at any given moment. Um, peaceful assembly is another form of freedom, right? Uh, this basically entails the right of citizens to gather publicly or privately um, and collectively express, promote, pursue, and defend common interests. So, you know, for example, um, a couple of years ago, we seen what was happening with Black Lives Matter as far as, you know, police brutality uh, and things going on in certain communities, you know? So, Again, these are usually forms of um, gathering. In, in in the case of Black Lives Matter, over 90% of those protests uh, were nonviolent, right? Um, regardless of, you know, what social media or the internet might say. Um, and this is statistically proven as well. So the reality is peaceful assembly is very important. It's key. Um, it allows for, you know, for the needle to move as far as uh, the issues that go on in society on a given day or any you know any year or what have you um and then basically the freedom of expression the right to access information critically evaluate and speak out against policies and actions of state and non-state actors right so having these three different rights are very important um and they're crucial basically to the fabric of of this country you know uh the first amendment basically is the freedom of speech right um, and from that amendment, you can basically get into a lot of interpretations and you can break that further down on a nuclear level. But ultimately, these are the three uh, the three main freedoms that society has been granted in order to be able to express thought. So now, you know, in the in the days of old, like when you talk about people like Socrates and Plato, Aristotle, you know, these great Greek philosophers, um, you know, or you want to talk about um you know just poets and um just thinkers of free thought you know from the isaac newtons to the galileos and what have you everybody had their own general space that they were able to speak at you know what i'm saying there was always a civic square and a, a central gathering place where people knew if they wanted to hear new thoughts and new ideas this is where i have to go to and this is where you know i can receive this information for some of us it might be a church, it might be a mosque, a synagogue. Uh, for others of us, it might be, you know, pulling up to the, to the, uh, you know, the the arcade spot or you know the the pool place to play pool or what have you. Um, it all depends on what type of information and what type of expression you're looking for. Uh, but when we're talking about in modern day society, what the new civic uh, civic square has become is primarily hip hop and social media. So. Hip hop at this point, for example, is a over $10 billion industry. Um, even though there has been statistics recently that have come out showing the decline of hip hop, the reality is that hip hop has influenced a whole generation, if not even more than that. Um, you're talking about it has made its way internationally. Um, you know, you could look at Latin America and music that we have, such as reggaeton, dembo. You know, Latin trap, those are derivatives of hip hop. Um, so the reality is that hip hop is one of the largest, um, you know, music genres out there, if not the number one consumed music genre. It actually passed rock um, a couple of years ago as the most consumed music genre. And even more interesting than, than anything is the predominant consumer of hip hop um, are white. <laughs> you know, are prim primarily Caucasian. And so it shows that hip hop has, you know, translated across different demographics, 
Um, it has made its way into parts of society that probably 50 years ago, nobody would have ever thought. Um, or back in the 80s when Grandmaster Flash was saying, you know, uh, it's a jungle outside. Sometimes I wonder how I keep from going under, right? Like back in the day, nobody thought hip hop was going to make it to this point. But here we are, 2023, um, and there's all types of hip hop for every type of person. Um, you know, you have conscious uh, hip hop, you got country rap, you have, you know, rap that, you know, you can match along with a pop song. Uh, with Miley Cyrus or something like that. So the reality is it's such a broad spectrum um, and covers so much range that at the end of the day, it provides an outlet for everybody to consume a little bit of it to some extent. Um, why this is important is because hip hop, more than any other genre of music, is the genre that conveys the most thought. All right. And we're talking about um, pop, for example, the average pop song will average about 50 maybe up to 100 words in one three to four minute song. Hip hop in that same time frame is going to convey two to 300 words, okay? In, in hip hop, you got this thing called bars, right? Generally speaking, verses, like there's a, a verse, a hook, AKA a chorus, and another verse, and then the hook again. One verse is 16 bars, which each bar is basically a sentence. So in one bar, I started off one way. The next bar started off another. The following bar, I'm going I'm to make it rhyme with one of the previous bars. So the reality is you can get a lot of thoughts out by hip hop. And so when you do that through hip hop, um, you're putting thought frequencies out there that other people are going to pick up. And when they pick that up, they're going to take those thoughts and make it their own. Right. And that's part of what a civic square does. Basically, people put their thoughts out. You basically hear these different perspectives, you match them up against each other and you see, OK, I like this one, but I like this one a little better. Maybe I could blend it two and come up with my own thought or maybe I just want to only go with this thought right here and reject this one. So the reality is in that literal sense, hip hop basically has become in its own sense um, a civic square uh, because not only do you hear the music, you can create music yourself in response to what something you heard <laughs> made you feel, you know? So if I heard something from Nas and Illmatic, you know, now I get inspired to basically say, man, Nas, Nas says something incredible on that song, you know, in New York State of Mind. I wanna make my own version of that, you know what I'm saying? And, and basically now his storytelling uh, journey, you know, got translated into my core. And then from there, I'm like, okay, now I wanna, put my story out there for somebody else. And then it becomes a cycle of other people being inspired and creating new content, new information, uh, and putting out knowledge uh, that's going to benefit the, the people closest within their proximity or within their range. Now, if we talk about social media, social media on average is consumed two to three hours a day. Uh, that's on average. Uh, but the reality is we know people that consume social media even longer than that on a daily basis. When you go on Instagram, more information is coming to you at such a rate than the human mind is capable of receiving. At no point in, in human history and known history um, have we had this much information making its way to our pupils, to our retinas at one time. All right. And. With that being a factor, the reality is you get to have a lot of conversations. You get to dialogue on a lot of different things and you might do it in spurts or you might do it in bunches or you might do it however you feel, right? But the reality is now you can have dialogue on this digital platform called Instagram. Not only Instagram, you're talking Facebook, you're talking Snapchat, you're talking TikTok, YouTube, Twitter, which is now X. Um, you're talking all these different platforms where you basically can consume content and then you divulge in thought, you engage in conversation and thought processes because that's what a civic square is. And so in its literal sense, social media and hip hop have become the new civic squares. Um, social media has become so large that there's countries that basically put a limit on how often you can consume it because they, you know, they've studied up on the different effects that it can have on a person and you know, they, they have their stance and that's where they stand with it. Um, but, you know, going back to hip hop, for example, when you put this music out there, 
you can now at the barber shop have these conversations with people around, you know, the the line who are waiting for the for the next haircut. Yo, did you hear what Nas said the other day? Yo, that was crazy. Wow, I can't believe it. You know, and then if you come up with something and then you put it out there, now you get to break down for somebody what that process looks like. A lot of a lot of things that we see in hip hop, a lot of things that we see in social media, oftentimes are linked to social issues, right? Um, police brutality, poverty, um, war, weapons, drug addiction. A lot of these things surface in hip hop and in social media. Um, you know, when we see a situation of police brutality on Instagram, in one day it goes viral and then everybody's outside protesting. You know, uh, this is the new Civic Square. And I'm going to give you an example of how powerful this tool is right here. So right here, this is a picture of Martin Luther King at the famous uh, March to Washington, D.C. Do you know how many people uh, attended this event? How many people this attracted? We're talking about over 250,000 people. So this is a picture at the same location, but in 2020, after the incident with George Floyd, and pretty much we can see a similar type of reflection from years before. All right, we're talking one happened in the six, you know, in the sixties, late sixties, going into into the seventies, and we're talking about one that happened in twenty twenty. Now, guess how many people the BLM Instagram alone reached? So the BLM standing for Black Lives Matter. So if we're talking about the Instagram of this one organization that helped gather all these people together, we're talking about just following this page, over 4 million people. And this is at the time that, you know, I pulled this picture up. Now, going back to Martin Luther King, Martin Luther King was able to bring over 250,000 people without social media. Okay. What would that number be? <laughs> if Martin Luther King had Instagram back in the day, okay? That's just food for thought. Now, there's over four, 4 million people that follow the BLM, um, the BLM Instagram, but that's 4 million people that directly follow it because the reality is there's people that still see the content that maybe they promote through sponsorships because on Instagram you have ad features, you can sponsor a flyer, right? So even if I don't follow your page, your post will still end up on my feed somehow because you're, you're, you're sponsoring it. You paid for ad support. So now it's being sponsored. Uh, maybe somebody that I follow follows the BLM page and they posted it up on their story or they posted it on the feed. So even though I don't follow, follow the page directly, I'm basically able to still see the content and you know, if I didn't know about it, but it was something that interested me, I'm like, okay, now nah, I definitely want to be a part of this for sure, right? So, again, this is not including hashtags, right? There's a hashtag for Black Lives Matter. Um, it's not including the Twitter page. It's not including the Facebook page. WhatsApp is another uh, tool that's used and, you know, so on and so forth. And the thing about today is news can be reported by the people, Um and, and basically, when it is reported by the news, it's not necessarily taken with the same credibility anymore. So this is a picture of me um, a couple of years ago. This is before the pandemic. There was a rapper by the name of, by the name of Nipsey Hussle who got shot and killed. Um, he was somebody that basically, you know, in hip hop is very, unfortunately, you don't always see rappers... Um, necessarily supporting the community that they come from. A lot of times it's a lot of flexing. It's a lot of, you know, showboating. Hey, look at me, look at my money, which is cool. But every now and then you do want to see them going back to the community and doing something with the community. Uh, Nipsey Hussle was a great example of this because he created incubator spaces for people that had startup businesses. Um, he started his own clothing line through which, you know, some of that clothing he would get give away to people that were just coming home from prison and things like that. Um, and he was just on a, on a very revolutionary journey. You know, he was talking about um, 
wellness, you know, promoting, you know, just holistic uh, eating and lifestyle and things like that um, at the end of his life. So the reality is when he got shot and killed, a lot of people felt that because, you know, they, they were saying he was like the closest thing to Tupac since Tupac. You know, Tupac was a very revolutionary minded individual, even though he expressed himself through hip hop. And sometimes, you know, it could have been misinterpreted, uh, mis misinterpreted. The reality is that Tupac was the son of a Black Panther. <laughs> so he had this revolutionary mindset basically from a young age. Nipsey Hussle, same thing with him. Uh, so when it was felt, you know, Nipsey Hussle, even though in his youth he was associated with, you know, the streets and he was, you know, he got involved with the with, with the gang, the Crips, right? Um, because that's what often happens when you don't have guidance and things like that. The reality is, as he got older and he lived that lifestyle and he got fame, money, access, power, things like that, he actually, at the end of his life, was working with the LAPD to basically set up events that would target young people to keep them from joining gangs. So even though he was a uh, an affiliate, right, because, you know, the, that's just the code. Once you get into that that lifestyle, you can't you can't just say I'm not in it no more, right? You either just gotta kind of like fall in the shadows a little bit, or that's it, you know. But you can't flat out deny that. Um, the reality is, he started working with LAPD to at least intervene from other youth getting involved in that lifestyle because he already knew what that came with. Long story short, um, here's a picture of me with a couple of people, and you know, I'm not affiliated with nothing, you know what I'm saying. I grew up in neighborhoods, however, where people are affiliated. So it's like you get cool with people, you know people, you learn their stories, things like that. Um, but basically everybody was outside um, just lifting up Nipsey Hussle's legacy, you know. And here is a big sheet with different bandanas basically stitched together, basically showing unity, you know. This was the first time in my life that I've seen people from rival gangs tie their bandanas together and basically walk down the street and say, we got to stop the violence. So even though not everybody's going to understand this type of, um, you know, camaraderie, the reality is it was felt in this neighborhood. This was in the Bronx where this was happening. Um, Snoop Dogg reposted it. Buster Rhymes reposted it. Many other people reposted it. It went viral. This is an example of a civic square uh, basically doing what it does. This is something that on no major media outlet did you see this image here. You did not see this on Fox News. You did not see this on New York One. You did not see this on Channel 11. You ain't see it on CBS, CNN. You ain't see it on none of those channels. But through social media, people are now able to self-report. You know, and that changed the game because some people may lean more towards a friend posting something that let's say the, the media outlet because the media may not really get the full scoop on what's going on sometimes. Um, And again, we already talked about the average amount of time someone spends on social media. We're talking about two hours. This was already probably like a, a, a statistic from about two years ago so that's probably gone up at this point um and at the end of the day we only have 24 hours in a day and spend eight of them sleeping so the rest of the time that we have a good amount of it is already spent on social media and again it's to engage in this civic square and to engage in conversation to receive food for thought to give out food for thought things like that uh not only not only that how much time is consumed on music right because we talked about hip hop, we talked about social media, but if we're talking about just music in general, the average person consumes about 27 hours in a week. Just think about it. When you watch television, right, which is not social media directly and is not hip hop directly, you watch a sporting event, your favorite player is coming out to hip hop. Um, a commercial that is about car insurance has hip hop in it. Um, you walk down the street, if you're in New York, you walk down the street, you pass by a bodega, they probably got some reggaeton or something happening over there. So the reality is music has consumed 
the public space. Um, it has become a civic space. Um, you know, hip hop and R&B made up 31% of the market in um, 2018. They were one of the top tracks that were sold at the time from Post Malone to Cardi B to J. Cole, right? And even more interestingly, uh, the USA track and field actually had a ban on using headphones and portable audio players um, during their official races because music is a performance enhancer, all right? Right before you get into a, a workout, an intense workout or a game or what have you, music really creates a very powerful rush in adrenaline. And so the USA track and field recognized the power of it to the point where they said, we, we got to put a ban on it <laughs> before competitions, right? So this is just to give you an example of how powerful music is and why it needs to be considered as something in, this, in, the, um, in the civic square or considered as a civic square, because at the end of the day, um, music diverts the mind. It promotes flow states for internal motivation. Um, synchronized music movements shift your workout. Uh, it also evokes emotions that enrich your enjoyment. All things that can overall add to your overall performance at a workplace, um, in school, whatever it is. For example, if we look at popular artists for MLB walk-up music, so whenever there's a baseball player walking out, walking to home plate about to you know, get ready to swing the bat, the number one genre that is come that they're coming out to is hip hop. Two hundred and fifty plus players will come out to hip hop. The next number, you know, would be rock, which is at over you know about one hundred forty eight. Then after that is reggaeton, another form of hip hop, and then country and electronic. You know, so the reality is in sports, which a lot of our students watch every day, they watch basketball, they watch football, they watch baseball, boxing, whatever they watch. Their favorite athlete is coming out to hip hop. So what I'm basically saying with all of this is we need to start incorporating hip hop into the academic space to whatever degree. If you teach literature, for example, you might want to use some of Tupac's lyrics and break that down and have students write an essay on it. What do you think about those lyrics? What are your thoughts? Put those lyrics in context to this situation over here. How how does it make sense? How does it match up with this scenario over here? Um, if you're talking about mathematics, right? Literally, there's a rapper by the name of Most Deaf who literally has a song called Mathematics <laughs> and is literally going through all the different ways in which the universe is a mathematical equation. That would be a perfect opportunity to teach math using hip hop all right um if you want to talk about physics science stem things like that you know hip hop is not only the music it's the graffiti it's the b-boying the break dancing you know what i'm saying let's let's talk about the physics of somebody spinning on their back or on on their head or you know doing a certain move what the, what are the angles that it takes for your arm to go from here to here right like these are things that can help you get your goal across, which is, you know, teaching the students whatever subject you're teaching, but also making it a very interesting experience and informative experience on top of that. Just like us, right? Students just want to learn based on whatever's interesting to them. The things that we put our time into to, to learn, we learn those things because they are of interest to us. We cannot project and expect that others are going to find interest in that same thing. So if I want somebody to be interested or as passionate about my topic as I am, I need to give them the opportunity, you know, to be able to digest this in a more, you know, in, in, a, in a much easier fashion. So if I have to, for, for the lack of better terms, spoon feed them a little bit, hip hop would be a perfect example. Social media would be a perfect example. They already consume these things for free. They already spend two to three hours a day on social media. Then they spend another couple of hours listening to music. When they're on the, when they're on the train, when they're on the bus, they're listening to music, right? Let me make an assignment that basically lets them know, hey, listen to your favorite song and, you know, write a, a reflection on it or, you know, whatever. Like, whatever your subject matter is, there's many different creative ways that one can go about it. You know, hip hop is so influential that, you know, 
for example, the NWA with Ice Cube, Eze, e Dr. Dre, um, when they came out, they they literally came out with White Sox gear, right? The the White Sox were 18th in at the year 1990 in product sales in baseball out of 26 teams. When NWA came out wearing the White Sox hat, they ended up being the third most selling team when it comes to uh to merchandise literally only because nwa started wearing their merchandise we even had president obama at the time come out with a summer uh a summer playlist during the daytime and during the nighttime of what the president listens to even politicians are up on this and they recognize hey listen <laughs> we got to reach these young people one way or another so all right let me let me show you my list of people i listen to so they're going to have, you know, he's going to have Nas. He's going to have Aretha, Aretha Franklin, who, you know, is not a hip hop necessarily, but it, a lot of hip hop does come from sampling, which comes from like, you know, soul, jazz, things like that. Um, you have Wale, you have Jay-Z, right? Um, and Michelle Obama even did a music video, a rap video with Jay Farrell, um, basically encouraging students to go to college. I'm not going to play the video. Uh, I'm not even going to say it was the best rap that I've ever heard, but the effort is there. <laughs> so that's all I can say about that. And even Bernie Sanders came out and said that Cardi B is right. Who would have thought Bernie Sanders would be quoting Cardi B at any moment in history? But here we are. Uh, Stacey Abrams was supported by um, Atlanta rappers like Ludacris, T.I., um, and even a candidate for mayor of Chicago was supported by Chance the Rapper. So the reality is hip hop, social media, these things are basically the new civic squares. Jay-Z, even though he started off with music, basically ended up developing his own um, sports agency, Rock Nation, where he signed some of the top athletes from Robinson Cano to CeCe Sabathia to Victor Cruz, Kevin Durant, et cetera, et cetera. So long story short, um, we want to give our students the opportunity, you know, to have fun, creative ways to make assignments. Um, whether you want to use hip hop or not, you know, it's just an idea. Um, but even if not hip hop, give them the opportunity to learn in different ways and different fashions. Right. Maybe you want to create a Jeopardy game. You create like I teach criminal justice. This would be a Jeopardy game where, you know, punishment for 100 to 400 or alternatives, 100 to 400. Name the five individuals who, who served 10 plus years for rape um, and attempted murder, but were all found innocent. And then we got the Central Park Five here. You know, you click on another one. Name the individual who did not have a speedy trial and was kept three years in Rikers Island only to be found innocent. Khalif Browder, right? These are fun, engaging ways, um, you know, to get students to learn. Again, back to the social media example. And an example of this would be if you want to, like, I teach criminal justice. So while this was happening, I would probably make an assignment saying, you know, go to your feed and in the search bar look for the hashtag george floyd or look for the hashtag social justice find uh how many you know how many posts come up from that so in, in the case of george floyd over two million um you know and and like if you're a math teacher for example you can use that as part of a mathematical equation to solve you know so the reality is um there's no reason to not incorporate these things into the classroom and you can keep it relevant, you can keep it fresh, and the students are really going to respect you because it is because students want to learn. They genuinely want to learn. Students learn all the time, but they just don't learn what you're teaching them specifically all the time, uh, but they learn what they want to learn at any given moment. But if you find a way to make what you're teaching exciting and fresh and new for them, they'll gravitate towards it and they'll appreciate it and they'll want to learn more. You know, at the end of the day, we live in a, you know, one of the pro, I mean, um, social media has so many pros to it, but one of the cons is the attention span has shrunk dramatically. All right. So now you're competing with a shortened attention span. So it's like you really got to get their attention like this and get their interest like that, or else you might, you might lose them for the rest of the class. So um, it's important to, to, you know, be active with that um you know or if you want to even talk about certain topics like in criminal justice 
you know, I, I expose my students to ideas that are not necessarily popular. So this is an example of what Rikers Island looks like, um, an overhead view. And then this is an example of the housing projects, which is also located in New York City, right? This is not by coincidence. And so I get, I, I break down what institutionalization looks like uh, and what it could potentially lead to for the sake of our students, you know? So again, an example of introducing hip hop, a Tupac lyric, lyric says, it's time to fight back. That's what Huey said, two shots in the dark, now Huey's dead, you know? So I'm gonna skip this part right here. Like I said, I also rap as well. Some of these slides I totally forgot to take out, so my apologies. Um, but pretty much, that's about it. Um, right here is my information. This is my uh, my Instagram handle at the bottom, um, as well as my email. Um, if you guys can please, you know, take out your phones. Uh, what's it called? And basically, just just take this QR code down. I would definitely appreciate if you could leave a comment on my website, Abstract Lifestyle, uh, regarding the presentation, your thoughts, feedback, um, what you thought was good, what you thought I could do better, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, I'll leave this here for like two or three minutes, but I do want to open it up for Q&A uh, for anybody that has any questions, you know, any thoughts that they would like to get out there. So, um, you know, if, if you if you would like to share a thought or ask a question, please unmute yourself. You know, and, and let's hear let's hear your thoughts. Yeah, I'm not sure if the uh, if if somebody does want to speak, you'll have to use the raise hand feature, and I believe I can then allow you. I can unmute you for that. Also, feel free to drop questions into the Q and A if you do not want to speak up yourself, because I did see that the chat was quite lively. Mm. Okay, let's see. Let's see. Uh, I wasn't able to see the chat this whole time because it doesn't show on on my side. Uh, I can see it now. Social media allows for all to have their own platform, soapbox for sure. Uh, it would have broke the internet. I didn't know that about Pac. That's incredible. Hip hop music is commercialized. Commercialized now. It's very popular. Absolutely. Michael Phelps listens to Lil Wayne before every competition. They said the guy that um, that killed Osama bin Laden uh, was listening to the game right before he did that. <laughs> um, so he was listening to hip hop. He was listening to gangster rap specifically, which kind of makes sense. You know, you go on a mission like that, you don't want to listen to Kelly Clarkson, right? So, <laughs> so the reality is, hip hop is definitely, um, you know, a stimulator of emotions, adrenaline. It, it depends on your mood and what you want to listen to. You know, um, some hip hop is aggressive. Some hip hop is very thought provoking. Some hip hop, you know, is spiritual. You know what I'm saying? Like. I mean, to me, hip hop in general is spiritual, but it just depends how you want to interpret that. Um, let's see. Yep. Shout out to Dr. Chris Emden. Um, he helped revolutionize this movement called uh, Hip Hop Ed. Um, I've met him a couple of times. Amazing individual. Um, definitely look up uh, Chris Emden. Let's put it right here, Dr. Chris Emden, because he has several books that talk about how to incorporate hip hop into the classroom experience um, and things of that nature, you know. And and this is and he's a professor in STEM um, and he taught at Columbia University for several years. Now he has a, you know, I think a, a fellowship at another school. Um, but Dr. Chris Emden is doing amazing things. Absolutely. Five elements of hip hop. Definitely, you know. So again, hip hop is not just rapping; it's also, um, you know, be, the 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 disc jockeying, DJing, right? Taking two sounds that maybe don't sound nothing alike, and then kind of blending it. You got the graffiti element of it. You got break dancing. Uh, you got the MCing component. You know, so all these elements can be incorporated one way or another into some type of. Um, you know, lesson in, in your classroom and what have you. And again, social media too. Um, will you share this PowerPoint? Um, reach out to me. If if you want a copy of this PowerPoint, again, I'll post my information in the chat. So here's my email. And then on Instagram, 
This is my handle. Um, thank you for your time to change it. No, thank you. Thank everybody. I thank everybody for being present, you know, because y'all could be anywhere else right now. Um, but y'all are here trying to get some new information to provide to your students. So that says a lot about y'all, you know, so I clap it up for y'all really. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm just trying to share a little something here. Um, Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, so again, if, if y'all can scan that QR code and you know just provide like a little feedback and all that, that would definitely be um, appreciated. You know, as that that'll help me in being able to secure more um, you know presentations and to keep sharing this information with other institutions and conferences and things like that. Um, I guess last thing, because I skipped over it, would y'all like to actually hear a rap that uh, that I made myself and that I would actually perform for my students? Well, I'm going to say on behalf of the audience, yes. And then after that, we have a question that did come into the Q&A. Okay, for sure. All right, so this one is called No Bad Energy. So it's talking about the school to prison pipeline and how a lot of it is intentionally designed and structured like this. Um you know, nothing is by accident. So I'm my ancestors wildest dreams come into fruition. My people come from places where we have rotten conditions. According to the bureaus, I'm supposed to be a statistic analytics, call me criminal before my birth or existence. I'm out here with a blade, some got a glot for resistance. I'm just trying to stay safe from shock of going ballistic. The media try to ruin us with shots at our image. They don't show what's going to Harvard, only shots of ballistics. We on the front page, it look like a gun range. Call a brother Thug Strange, one white snort the cocaine. College data plug, man, then they model ball, man. We known to play sports, all so state me no cage. Quick to hook a brother up, a pair of state greens. People who are higher up just want to stay green. Opioid and epidemic like the crack scene. They want us to stay folk or want us to stay fiends. All these politicians just be talking, don't be walking. All this political jargon cover up many of your caucus. Never side with issues less in need of our support. Otherwise, we up in court. If they're running for a caucus genocidal, then it turns suicidal. Oh, I messed up right there. <laughs> What's it called? Um, Let me run it back. Suicidal, then, it be, then it's genocidal. Put their hands on the Bible. Money remains a idol, office remains idle. Asking for an inch now, we get an, we never get a mile. How will people be sobbing? All of them just be throbbing. Young is big and robbing. We have no Batman and Robin. They done killed all our heroes. Memory of them zero. Homie, this here a jungle and lion tigers is feral. School to prison pipeline of pipe dreams. The bridge got no bike lines because you were pipe fiends. Homie on this island, dudes be wild and you might see a lot of stuff in daytime reserved for the night scene. You see some brothers getting murdered up, homie stabbed up. You see some youngers getting jumped out, getting grabbed up, sexually assaulted and get told to man up. And if you don't man up, then you might just hang up on everything. Everything is everything. Food calls your wedding ring. Promise your life's up for grass, reinvented slavery. Get them while they're young, hyper suspension, expulsions. Way to keep them ignorant. Education give convulsions. Anytime they think about school, they think of trauma. Tears were shed from the disappointment of their mama. Teacher once told them they'll never amount to nothing. That teacher up in the future faces student, now a gunman. No bad energy. I haven't performed that one in a little while. <laughs> so yeah, it's hard in the stumble. And, and that really does tie into a little bit into the question because you can see some of the challenges that our young adults are facing. So the question that came in was, what do you say to young adults to stay and earn a degree or certificate? How do you convince them? For sure. That's an excellent question. Um, I think, number one, you have to let them know that whatever they do, they can be authentically themselves. Because um, oftentimes the dread of a lot of young people is, I don't want to work a job I'm going to hate for the rest of my life because essentially that's like a form of slavery, right? Who wants to work somewhere for the rest of their life and, you know, basically make money. And by the time that they make it to 60, 70, they look back at their life and they're like, I hated it. I hated all of it. Who wants to do that? So we have to give young people something to look forward to, which is 
you might have to do it for like a year or two just to at least you know build some type of foundation resume what have you but how you brand yourself how you promote yourself as far as you know escalating the ladder career wise things like that a lot of it is based on you take your interests wear them on your sleeve you know if you're passionate about something on the side how can you incorporate that into whatever you do i always let my students know when i worked in the halfway house I was a 21 year old fresh out of college working with grown men just coming home from prison. They was 30, 40 years old looking at me like this. <laughs> like, who's this little guy over here trying to teach me about life? But I would use hip hop as a way to connect with them. And that really that really changed everything because, you know, now I'm able to connect with them better. That makes it a lot easier for me to do my job. And they're actually receiving the information a lot smoother and me being successful in that arena gave me the experience I needed to eventually become a college professor. So one thing always leads to the next, but when you lead with your passion, when you lead with things that, you know, you're optimistic about and that you, and that are authentically you, you pretty much increase the probability of, of success because now you don't, you don't even feel like you're working. And that's the key. Like when you go to work, do you feel like you're working? You know what I'm saying? And so if you can get people to start thinking like that and to envision there is a reality where you can where you can make money and enjoy it and not feel like you're working. If you can let people think that that's a possibility, then I would lead with that, you know, but a lot of it also has to stem from us. We have to also incorporate some of these things into the classroom ourselves. Any interests, any hobbies that we have on the side, you know, be be vulnerable. Let let the students know. I'm a human too. I'm not, I'm not this stoic professor 24 seven, like, yeah, A, B, F, you know what I'm saying? Like come through, let them know that, Hey, listen, I have hobbies too. And find a way to incorporate that into the classroom so that they see that you're having fun at your job. And so that they know that it's possible for them to have fun at a future job that they have as well. You know? And I think once they understand that, that you can have fun making money, you know, later on in life or in the present or wherever, I think that'll be a, a, a heavy encouragement for them to pursue degrees and certificates and, and things like that.